Welcome everyone to this edition of the Sustainable Finance Research Seminar at the University of Zurich. I'm extremely happy to have with us Paul Smits, who has been on our seminar before, but he's back with a new paper. Um, and it's titled, Do Financial Advisors Charge a Premium to Responsible Investors? Certainly a question that many people are wondering these days. Um, so, Paul, welcome very much to our seminar. We're looking forward to your presentation. The usual ground rules apply, right? Sort of if you have a question in between, uh, feel free to speak up and we'll try to save some time for Q&A towards the end. All right, Paul, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Julian, and uh, nice to be back with indeed a new and fresh paper together with uh, my uh, co-author Martin Laudi, who is a PhD student in Maastricht and with Oud Zweitzel from the Free University of Amsterdam. And uh, it's, it's a really good time also to present this paper because at the moment we are planning a second experiment uh, to, to add to the paper and to, to add some additional evidence. Uh, I will briefly talk about that at the end uh, and I'm very much looking forward to your feedback so that we can take that into account when, uh, when we run this second experiment. So let me just uh, introduce myself a little bit more. So um, over the last years, I have been uh, working on the question, what motivates individuals to give to charity and investors to invest in a sustainable manner? So I've been looking at uh, all kinds of different groups. So for example, uh, millionaires, high net worth individuals and how how they invest and donate, what motivates them to give or not give. Um, I've been looking at uh, retail investors, pension fund participants, and today uh, I will focus on uh, financial professionals. Besides that, uh, I combine a lot of uh, psychology with uh, financial decision making. So I have a a paper together with uh, my co-authors from Maastricht where we study investor memory. So how do investors memorize their returns and how does that influence the way they make, uh, they make decisions? Um, but I won't talk about that today because I will uh, talk about financial advisors and particularly the, the social responsible mandate that they often get from clients because uh, that has been growing quite a lot um, in terms of uh, money invested, but also in terms of number of mandates. And at the same time, there is another development going on in, uh, in Europe, and that is that the European Union is uh, preparing uh, legislation that will uh, be an amendment to MIFID II. Perhaps you're familiar with MIFID II. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge pile of documents uh, that say how financial institutions should deal uh, with clients. One of the things that is in this method too right now is that uh, institutional investors have to ask their clients about their risk preferences and accordingly uh, advise a more risky portfolio or a more risk averse portfolio. But what will be added to that is that these financial institutions have to ask about responsible investment preferences. Now, on the one hand, uh, that could be a, a promising development because uh, it means that there could be growth in the responsible investment because now clients are actively asked about it and therefore might be more likely to give a responsible mandate. But there is also this danger uh, that uh, at least some financial regulators are warning for saying that, well, it might be that financial professionals take this knowledge about uh, their clients' responsible investment preference just as a signal of being able to charge a higher premium, a, a, a higher fee to those clients. The Financial Advisor Association says, no, that's not the case. We, we will not uh, charge higher fees. No. So that's an empirical question now. Uh, and that's actually 
the question that uh, that we address in this paper, like do financial advisors really charge a premium or not? And, and this is a recent article from the Wall Street Journal being quite critical about uh, sustainable finance, saying that it often has very little impact. Uh, a lot of work by, by Julian and, and, and Falco uh, also on that, uh, but that, uh, besides people not getting a lot of impact, they do pay more, right? So, so basically, consumers are paying for not having very much impact. So you see now this sort of criticism coming up in, in newspapers as well. But it's not really clear whether indeed financial advisors charge a higher fee. And if they do, what is the reason for that? Is it that these advisors are more skilled? They put more effort? or do they exploit their clients' preferences? So what I'm going to do is I will show you first the main results of our paper, and then I will take you step by step to our experimental design, the recruitment, how did we get our sample of financial professionals, and how exactly do we tease out all the different results. But the first main result is, uh, good news uh, for consumers and that is namely that if consumers give a sustainability mandate to their advisor they also get a portfolio that reflects those responsibility preferences at least to some degree so that is nice so that means that uh, consumers can outsource their responsible investment preferences to advisors but now the not so good news for the consumers uh, is, but maybe good news for the advisors, is that they are able to charge a premium and that these consumers also pay that premium. And if I just do a little bit of a back of the envelope analysis, basically the amount that is invested according to SRI mandates and the extra fees that are charged, then you see, because our study is, is set in the US, as I will later show you, that this amounts uh, to quite a substantial additional fees that are being paid by sustainable investors. And this is not a result of more effort uh, or more skill or more costs, uh, as I will show you in the, in the design. So this fee, this additional fee that responsible investors pay is not a compensation for, for extra costs. And then uh, I will also show you an external validity check. So uh, we asked a sample of uh, 53 financial regulators from this European group that is coming up with this regulation that will require the response investment preferences from, for example, the Dutch Authority of Financial Markets, which is Dutch regulator, and several other European regulators. We let them first predict the results of our study. And I will show you that they did not correctly predict the results. Uh, but then also uh, we asked them whether they think that our results actually require policy uh, intervention or not. I will show you that later. Paul, so, may I jump in already? Sure. I'm Stefan. Hi. Nice to Hi, see Stefan. you on, on this. Uh, um, can you put this into perspective? So you said it's like around five basis points. That means that the typical advice is about 100 basis points or 150 basis points. And then we are talking about three, four, five percent. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the average fee is about one percent. And this is then on, on top of that. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so it's five percent higher. More or less. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. All right. So it's a. Uh, it's, it's a small premium, but if you add that up and also if you would sort of exponentially take that through through the years, then it still adds up to to quite a big uh, quite a big amount. Yeah. All right. Good. More questions before I continue. Good. Then. Um, so first of all, uh, there is this literature in uh, financial advice, 
which shows that advisors very often have conflicts of interest with their clients and that also results into uh, not, not the best outcomes for, for consumers. Now, what we add to this literature is basically showing that uh, there is an additional source with which uh, financial advisors uh, can earn more money from their consumers, and that is by uh, looking at responsible investment preferences. And that then also fits to earlier work showing that uh, many investors are willing to pay uh, a premium, so they, they are willing to accept higher fees or they accept lower expected returns to invest in a sustainable manner. And uh, as a result of that, uh, yeah, an advisor can, of course, take that into account when setting the fee. So that gets me to the, um, to the experimental design. So the way it works is that we, first of all, we have uh, advisors. And uh, these advisors, they always create uh, investment portfolios for their clients. And uh, so they have a SRI mandate or a conventional mandate that they receive from their clients. And then uh, they, they create a portfolio and I will show you how exactly they do it. And after that, they set a fee that they will want to charge to the clients. So if the client accepts that fee, then the client will see the portfolio that is created by the advisor pay the fee, so that money now goes to the advisor. Um, and if the uh, client says, well, I re reject the offer, then the client obviously doesn't pay the fee, but now has to make his or her own uh, investment decision. And uh, we have uh, always, for each advisor, four different client profiles uh, where we randomize the order. Uh, and also uh, that allows us to have different combinations of responsible investors with male, with female, conventional, with male and female clients. And we picked and always one out of those four and that one will be implemented. So the way this works is that uh, here on the left, you see what the, uh, what the financial advisors see about a given client. Uh, so, um, well, we, we always randomize all of these elements, but um, what we don't randomize is the risk profile. So we always put the risk profile on aggressive. And the reason for that is that an aggressive risk profile can go 100% into equity. And to keep our setting simple, we have a pure equity setting. Uh, but the rest you see varies. So, for example, this specific client gives this advisor a responsible investment mandate. Then um, on the right, you see uh, how the investor, uh, the advisor creates the portfolio. So here you see the Dow Jones index. And what, what you can see here is that uh, we, we preset the weights of the companies that are in the Dow Jones. And now an advisor can drag this bar to either increase the weight of a given company or to decrease the weight of that company. So here is the additional information that a, an advisor can get. So if they click on a certain company, then this uh, window opens. And here we show characteristics of the company based on a pre-survey that we did among a set of other financial advisors, so not, not the same ones, and we asked them to uh, tell us the characteristics of a stock that they are most likely to look at. And, and those answers that uh, appeared on the top, we decided to include here. Um, so this is the financial information, but then there is also two indicators of responsible, uh, uh, yeah, res responsibility, sustainability of the companies that we use, um, because we know these ratings, they can differ quite a bit. So we have one indicator 
for whether it's a responsible investment mandate or not. Uh, and that is uh, the United Nations Global Compact. So a company can sign up to that or not. So that says yes or no. Plus we have the MSCI uh, sustainability scores. And they come sort of in, yeah, and they are presented in two different ways. So one is from triple C to triple A. Uh, that's more fine grained. And then there is uh, this more summarized measures, red, yellow, and green. So that's all information that we give to the advisors for free. So whereas in the real world, it might be that advisors have to pay for these sustainability ratings, which they often use as, as an argument uh, why they need to set higher fees. In our experiment, that's not the case because we give this information for free. So after the advisor made a portfolio for a client, he or she decides to set a fee by dragging this bar. And then once the fee is clicked in, uh, that can no longer be changed. Now a client will see this fee and can then decide, hey, I accept and then sees the portfolio or the client doesn't pay the fee and does not see the portfolio. So we have a payment uh, system set up in such a way that all the uh, decisions that are made are really consequential. So that means that we actually buy the stocks in the market. So in total, we invested about 20,000 euros. So yeah, it was quite a substantial experiment. That is also important because uh, now it really matters in which companies uh, these people invest. Yeah, because either we buy responsible companies or not, uh, nah, and, and as you could see, some investors didn't give a responsible investment mandate, which means that we also invested uh, quite some money into SIN companies. Um, just to show you this, and I won't go into too much detail, but uh, people also got real money. So the clients got real money. They got an endowment. Uh, and from that endowment, they could get a positive return. Well, then they would make more money, but they could also lose money. Right? So if the, if the investments actually do bad, then that is subtracted from their amount. And we pay them after one year. So we hold stocks for a year, then we sell them, and then uh, they, they get the return paid. And the advisors, they get paid uh, if the client accepts uh, the fee, and they get that amount, and otherwise they, they don't make any, any earnings. So here's just to show you uh, that we provided proof of stock transactions to the participants. Uh, so they could, they could see that we actually really bought the stocks. And we also pre-registered our study with uh, the AE, AARCT registry. Uh, so you can look at that and there you can see uh, what we already originally also had planned to do uh, how we analyze things so just that that is common knowledge and obviously we we got irb approval uh, for the study from the ethics committee so a little bit about the background of the of the uh, financial professionals we recruited 345 in the united states you see in this map that these advisors uh, are spread throughout the US. And so uh, you, you see some advisors uh, clustered, of course, in California and in the, in the East Coast, uh, which makes sense because that's where you see a lot of investment companies, but they are really spread throughout the US. Um, what we did is we recruited uh, financial professionals that uh, are somehow related really to Consumers. So if they work in IT or HR, uh, we, for example, do not include them. So let me first check whether anyone has a question about our design be before I go into the results. Maybe one question, if I may. Sure. Uh, on one slide, you mentioned something about a base rate of $150. Um, yeah. But so the advisors were paid purely if, so under the condition that the uh, client accepts and then they were basically paid 
whatever they charged. Yes, so there was a thousand euro investment. So if the uh, if the advisor sets a one percent fee, they get ten euros. If they set a a one and a half percent fee, they get fifteen euros. Two percent fee, twenty euros. If the client accepts um, for the client, so they they get one hundred fifty euros. Um, we select one in ten clients because we we don't have the money to pay uh, everyone. But that's been shown before that this method of paying one of out of ten people actually doesn't influence the results. So, um, and if a client is selected for payment, so they get this 150. Now let's say, uh, because we invest 10,000 euros for, for that client, that was another reason why we couldn't implement all, all investments because now we had to invest 20,000 euros. Otherwise we had to invest 200,000 euros, which, which I don't have on my bank account. Uh, so, uh, so if we invest this 1,000 and let's say, the return is 10%. So then the client makes 100. So he or she had 150 and now gets 100 on top. So that means after a year, we pay 250 euros to the client. So that, that's quite a substantial amount that these people can make. Um, if they lose on the other end, so let's say we invest the thousands, but the stocks go down by 10%. Well, then it goes down by 100. So now we subtract this 100 from the 150 euros and we only transfer 50 euro to the client. Did you consider losses of more than 15%? What happens? Then they get zero. Okay, so they have sort of... Okay. Yeah. They have this fallback option. Yeah. Which probably affects the results but uh, to a full understanding. Okay. Understand. So, so, so how would it, how how would it affect the the results? Because in the end, you could you could invest risk more. That that is true. That is true. Which which doesn't maybe affect your treatments, but if you if you perceived no for the level for the level risky. level it could matter, but for our results on how much fees are charged, yeah, I don't see how this should matter. It's, so maybe one related issue is. We know from other research, for example, all these experimental asset markets, that participants have difficulties when the when the experimental design somehow differs from reality. So, when we have we have these uh, papers on uh, declining fundamental values in asset markets, and people are just confused, and therefore all kinds of different things happen. So here, um, by design. Uh, choosing a sustainable option is not at all more effortful or whatever. But in reality, it might be. So there might be changes in legislation. I might have to pay more attention if I invest for someone in a sustainable way. So I might have to pay much more attention in reality. Could that maybe affect your results that this sort of like implicit transfer that a financial advisor perceives in real life sort of transfers into your experimental results? Yeah, so let, let me give uh, two answers to this question. So the first one is that, um, yeah, every, every experiment, and you, you know that as an experimentalist, you always have to make some compromises, right? That an experiment is by necessity a simplification of reality. And I cannot control what people bring into the lab from outside, that is with every experiment. If you just run a standard risk-taking experiment, a standard social preference experiment, there are always things that people can, can bring into the lab. So that's something I, can, I, cannot, uh, I cannot control. Uh, at the same time, for example, in my Journal of Finance paper, I showed even if that is the case, the decisions that people make in such an experiment have predictive value for the actual investments that they make in the future. Um, then when it comes to, to the effort uh, that they put, so what they get from us are these scores, so they don't have to pay for the scores. But there's still uh, additional effort that uh, you have to put if you wanna make uh, uh, the, the portfolio really very tailored to each client. So if you really wanna make it very sustainable, you have to dive 
into all these talks. You have to click open the, the, the links and then select the most responsible stocks and decrease the weight of the non-responsible stocks. And that's actually um, what I'm going to show you uh, because we have that information. So we see uh, how much time an advisor spends per client. And we also uh, have the survey program in such a way that we can see how, how many clicks uh, these advisors make when they change the portfolio weights. So that gives us two measures, which proxy for the effort that the, uh, that the advisors make. All right, thanks. Thanks for the question, Stefan. More questions? Good, then I'll go to the results. And the first result is uh, looking at the sustainability scores that these portfolios have when a client gives a responsible mandate versus not. And here I'm going to show you a couple of measures. So uh, one is the score of, uh, of the portfolio based on the United Nations uh, Global Compact. Then the two separate measures from the MSCI, red, yellow, green, or the letters, triple C to triple A, plus a composite measure that combines the United Nations Global Compact and the MSCI score. And what you see then uh, is that uh, indeed, if a client gives a responsible mandate on all the different measures, the client also gets a more responsible portfolio. But the effect size here is relatively small. And so that means that uh, the tilt towards sustainability is there, but it's not very big. But the client does pay more for the advice and so does pay a premium if he or she gives a responsibility mandate compared to the client who gives a conventional mandate and this is not because of any effort of time uh, this is related to to stefan's question so here you see we have um, two specifications so we have the amount of time that the advisor spent on a given client and here you see that the coefficient on the responsible mandate is not significant. So there's no extra time spent uh, on a responsible client. And there's also not more clicks, as you can see on the two right columns. Uh, so uh, that, that's also exactly the same. So that brings me to the financial uh, regulators survey. Um, and the, the first thing we ask them is, uh, to predict the, the results of our study. So that, that's not in this graph, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you, uh, and then I'll, I'll get to what you see here. So we ask advisors to predict the fee that was charged. Uh, oh, sorry, we asked the regulators to predict the fees that advisors would charge, and also the amount of effort and time they, they put in. So we explain the experimental design, and then the regulators have to make a prediction. So the, the regulators predict incorrectly our findings. So they do correctly predict that financial advisors charge a premium to responsible clients, but they think at the same time that the advisors put more time and more effort. And that's not what we see. Now, when it comes to external validity, we asked after uh, they made the prediction, these regulators, we said, now suppose that we find uh, that uh, the advisors charge a higher fee to these responsible investment clients without putting any additional effort. How uh, externally valid do you think that is? Now, and what you see here is uh, that uh, well, most regulators think that our results are actually externally valid and also require attention uh, from policymakers. And so about 80%, I think it's 81 to be exact, um, say that these results require attention from regulators. Then it's interesting to see what, what do they suggest um, uh, in terms of uh, regulation. 
So I mean, here we have three answers that, that mainly stick out. One is financial education of consumers. Well, that doesn't really uh, help, I would say, uh, because if I look uh, at the evidence of financial education, then you see that sometimes financial education can causally improve the quality of financial decisions. But that is the case for very intensive programs. And, and these are also hard to get people to, to take. And if you don't do an intensive program, you just do a simple, short financial education uh, activity that doesn't have any effect. That's what lots of randomized control trials have shown now. So this doesn't seem to be a very promising option. Then um, another thing that the, uh, that the regulators say is, well, we could standardize the fees. So that just means there is one fee and that fee is the same for a responsible portfolio and for a conventional portfolio. And that basically begs the question, yeah, who has to pay? So if this European regulation requires additional costs to financial institutions, well, then the question is, should the responsible clients pay for this or should all clients pay for that? And when I presented this paper to the Dutch uh, banking uh, uh, association or I presented to Dutch regulator that that's exactly the type of uh, yeah of decisions that now have to be made and where the financial sector is is still debating uh, who, who should bear the additional cost of responsible investments our study suggests if you don't do anything then there will be the responsible clients and but you, you can say, yeah, that's fine or that's not fine, that we don't take a position on that. We just show what the consequences of this European regulation would be. Um, and there, I think the third uh, suggestion of the regulators is, in my opinion, the most interesting one uh, or the most promising one. And that is uh, to have more standard, to have more transparency about the fees. And of, and of course, you could say, well, everybody can already see the fees online, which is true. Right? The information on fees is available. But uh, there is so much information out there that uh, when you look at the existing evidence, then I can see that people have a really hard time processing all this financial information. So one way how you could perhaps tackle that is if you say, okay, this is the cost for a responsible mandate and you immediately put next to it the cost of a conventional mandate. Well, then it's super clear uh, and it's not information that is buried in between a lot of other financial uh, statements that will just move the attention of the consumer away from the fees. And an interesting development, if I look, for example, at Dutch uh, authority financial market is they have a whole behavioral team where they also uh, take these uh, behavioral aspects into account and in how to design the regulation. So I will just summarize and then I will tell you the next steps that we have uh, in mind. And then I'm very uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that. So um, what, we, what we have seen is that responsible investors, they get charged a premium that is <clears throat> not related to the effort that the advisors put. Um, and that could have unintended consequences for this European regulation that is coming up. So in my opinion, there are now two big questions <clears throat> that are still open, basically three. So the first question is that in the in the, the current design has a couple of limitations. So Stefan already uh, alluded to one of the limitations. So for example, yeah, you, you always have a specific design choice that you make. So I want to see <clears throat> whether our results replicate if we take a completely different uh, design. Uh, I've been doing that with a lot of my recent papers to just replicate my own findings because we know from the literature that a lot of findings actually don't replicate. 
uh, uh, there's a big replication crisis. So I think in general, it's just nice to replicate the findings and then to change the design a bit to see, hey, are the results specific to the design that we chose or, or not? Because I'm always skeptical about my own findings. So that's number one. Um, but then I'm also curious to know whether if we introduce competition between advisors, does that take away the premium that is charged to responsible clients? <clears throat> and I would like to know um, whether it's specifically that advisors take knowledge about responsible investments as a signal for price discrimination, or do they just take any type of information about the clients as a signal? And so for example, um, let's say a client gives a value investment mandate. Is that also taken as a as a sign uh, to um, to overcharge? So therefore, we have a um, couple of next steps planned. And let me first tell you, uh, and then you can shoot on the design. Uh, you can kill it because then I have to go back to the drawing table to change. Um, but the thing, sort of the the idea we have now, uh, uh, which which I quite like uh, so far, is that we want to run an ultimatum game, a very simple one, as a classic ultimatum game, for, which works in the following way. So you have a proposer and you have somebody who accepts or rejects an offer. So let's take a very simple situation here. You have a, the financial advisor who can distribute 10 euros between him or herself and a client. Now, um, let's say if the advisor says, uh, well, 50-50 split and, and the client accepts, then they both get five euros paid. If the advisor says, oh, I only give you one euro and I keep nine, well, then it's very likely that the uh, client says, well, you can keep this change. I reject the offer and then both get zero. That's the standard ultimatum game. But here we then want to introduce basically a couple of twists. <clears throat> so the first one is to introduce a charity. So um, that means the following. So if uh, there is an agreement made between the advisor and the client, so the client accepts the offer, then we may make an additional donation of two euros to a charity. That could, for example, be a charity that plants trees. So now there is actually an incentive to come to, to an agreement, except for just the money you can make, because if you come to an agreement, there's a positive externality, just like you have a sustainable investment, you can create a positive externality. Namely, two euros are getting donated to a charity. And argu arguably, you could say that a responsible investor would be willing to, to accept now a slightly lower offer because he or she cares about this money to plant trees or to transfer money to poor people uh, in, in around the world. And that makes it interesting because what we can now do is the following. So we can tell the advisor whether this client is, uh, gave a responsible investment mandate or a conventional mandate. So now there is absolutely no difference in effort and cost. That is all completely ruled out. The only thing that now the advisor knows is this client is responsible or is not responsible. And if the advisor now believes that responsible clients are willing uh, to accept uh, worse offers, so willing to accept lower returns, well then obviously can make a worse offer to a responsible client and to a non-responsible client. And then we have a very different setting. So basically <clears throat> the way to think about our current um, design is also kind of an ultimatum game, but then with much more context around it. And here it would just be a pure, a pure ultimatum game with a little bit of a twist. And then we can introduce two additional elements into this ultimatum game. So the first one is um, we add other type of information. So we don't only look at um, responsible versus not, but we have other type of clients and we can see whether advice is also differentiate based on other 
investment styles. And what those styles exactly have to be, we still have to figure that out because ideally it's something where you would see a rationality for price discrimination, just like with the responsible and non-responsible clients. But that allows us to see, is there really uh, exploitation of purely responsible preferences or is it just any type of price uh, differentiation when you see different types of clients in the market, which I think is an important question. And we can nicely introduce that in this ultimatum game where the advisor, for example, makes a, a proposal to a value investor or to a small cap investor. And then the second element that we can do in this ultimatum game is we can introduce competition. Because there have been previous studies in the ultimatum game where you don't have one proposal who makes an offer to, uh, to someone else, but there are two proposals. And that means the client can now choose between these two proposals and obviously will choose the one that makes the higher offer. Well, that allows us to see if there is competition, is there still a premium that these responsible investors have to pay or does that premium completely disappear? Well, that, that are the um, things that we are currently uh, planning to add uh, to this paper. So um, I'm very curious to hear from you any questions, comments, disagreements about the current experiment uh, that I presented to you and about these plans uh, for the follow-up study. Hey, Paul, I'll uh, start. <clears throat> um, sure. So something, I'll, I'll think more about the new experiment that, that, that you have planned, which sounds interesting. But something that Stefan already uh, kind of mentioned is sort of, you know, maybe it's a small fee increase. And um, have you been thinking about studying also this in, in the real market? Uh, so we've we've started to look at that a little bit. It's it's kind of this worry that you know not just advisors but also asset managers, ETF providers, and so forth they would charge more for ESG funds in order to sort of harvest that willingness to pay. Um, and the, but the the results aren't very clear somehow. So. I mean, so maybe two questions. Do you plan to maybe look at that as well? Or, or do you have examples where you say, you know, I believe this is actually the case? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite tricky. Um, so there are some studies saying that the fees are higher or they say the fees are not higher. Uh, and it, it, it also very much depends what you compare it with, right? So what, what's the... What's the type of funds that you're going to look at? Uh, uh, so there are so many factors in the real world that um, that make this quite complicated. Uh, but I think it's something that I, yeah, I would be really happy to talk with you uh, 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 offline to see what would be the best way to do it. Because when we were looking into this, which we did, um, we were kind of struggling yeah, what, what, what should be the right, the right way to study this in the field? Yeah, we had the same issue. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hi, Paul, this is Florian. So, thanks a lot. Hi, really, Florian. <laughs> really interesting study. And really, I mean, very much aligned with, with our interests. So I was thinking about the policy implications for, you know, advisors charging higher fees and how that could be avoided. I was thinking of, for example, the study by Hartsmark and Sussman, but also our own experiment where we showed that investors, for example, they have really hard time assessing sustainability as an absolute attribute of a stock, for example. I mean, it's, uh, we're talking about impact is one ton a lot, 10 tons. So, and, and I, I guess if you talk about non-very sophisticated investors, that also may be the case with fees. And for example, these Morningstar Globes that just, you know, provide the normalized measures for investors on sustainability have moved a lot of fund flow. So what do you think would happen if you, if all your investors, not the advisors, would see, you know, distribution of fees offered and where 
their current fee stands compared to all the other fees that have been offered by other advisors. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what we need. That's what, um, uh, with the, the, remember the regulators, they gave <coughs> three, <coughs> three, um, sorry, I've been talking the whole day today and my voice is now cranking up on me. Um, but the, the regulators gave three questions uh, and the last one is on the, on the transparency. And here I think we indeed need something smart. So we need either really put side by side responsible versus conventional or really ranking. Uh, like the, uh, you, you could just put, like you have globes for sustainability, you could also make dollar, dollar signs with costs. So if it has one dollar sign, it's cheap. And if it has five dollar signs, it's, it's really expensive. And I think that that is exactly what your results suggest also with, with Julian and Stefan and Falco and also what the Halsmark uh, and Sussman paper uh, already suggest. And it's also what you frankly see. So my chair is in philanthropy and sustainable finance. And in the philanthropy world, you see the same pattern. You see that donors have a very hard time to judge which charity is effective and which charity is not effective. Um, and, and, and one of the things that I'm currently studying uh, together with uh, a, a big study on Facebook uh, is where we, um, yeah, we have been teaming up now with Facebook, so I have to see whether it works because it's always hard. Uh, but to study how donors uh, perceive different type of, uh, of effectiveness information. And I, and I think that's exactly where we need to go with the, with the fees as well. Well, um, thanks for talking today. Fascinating work as ever. So Paul, you can already imagine, of course, what my uh, point will be. How about we could actually triangulate this with SRI high net worth investors, the clients of those advisors. And you look at the regulators, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And now if we would actually see what the perspective respectively of uh, clients is, that'd be interesting. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Because do, do they know that they get charged more, for example? Yeah. Well, let's talk about it yeah. bilaterally. I think we should. Anders? Yeah, oh, me again. So, uh, Paul, on your new experiment, that's probably what you're interested in, perhaps most in what we think there. I mean, I think it's a great, if that hasn't been done, it sounds like such a logical extension of the ultimatum game. Uh, so just in itself, that's interesting. I also accept that it's a similar situation. So although much more abstract to what, what, you, are, what you are studying. Um, yeah, the only thought at the moment I have is that in our uh, paper, we see this interesting tension between our results and two other working papers that actually find a linear relationship between willingness to pay and impact. Uh, so mm -hmm. maybe you know them. It's like the Bonnefond and, and Landier, four authors, and the other one is Nadia Günster and Brodbach. I think you probably know them. So, and I think what we come away with is that if you offer impact or sort of, you know, as, as a contribution to charity, then it's a monetary amount that is fairly easy to grasp and relate to what you're willing to sacrifice. Whereas if you state it in terms of whatever, globes, birds, trees, uh, then, then it doesn't work as well. So that's maybe just something to consider when you uh, design this external effect. I don't yeah, think it's so at the what heart would you of... suggest is to what would you suggest is to take just the two euros going say to a poor person in Kenya? Well, you could sort of say two euros going to you know a charity that supports poor people, or um, you know paying for lunch of ten school children for a week. You know, like just 
without mentioning the dollar amount. It could be the exact, yeah. maybe you can even say, you know, $2 towards an organization that plants trees or just two trees. Maybe that's yeah. the easiest way. Um, and what would you I, I wonder, then if we compare two trees versus $2 to trees? Well, actually it only matters when you, when you scale it. So if you say $2 and $10, people will respond to that. And two trees and 10 trees, people will just think of trees. Yeah. Any number yeah. of trees. And th that is something that is that I think is really interesting. Um, Sanford Defoe from UCLA has some work also on uh, comparisons. And, and it seems that when people compare money, there is something else going on than when they compare other things like, time trees uh, and and uh, that, that that seems to be a pattern and it's still not so clear why that is the case so it, 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 i think it's something that is also interesting to understand better yeah it's maybe something in itself but, but it's something that we sort of figured out now and that we might just double down on yeah one thing you could you could say here is that um Perhaps it's more easy for people to evaluate money because they have so much experience with money. You know that then dollars buys you more than two, but it's not so clear to people how two or ten trees contribute to reducing global warming. Yeah, exactly. And and but also, I, you know, now I'm digressing. But in the context of philanthropy, right? It also touches upon this notion of what is a fair contribution. So if I think, okay, I, I, I earn $10 and I give $10 to someone, you know, to someone else, that sounds like a fair deal. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you think about it in terms of, you know, I, you know, someone doesn't really have anything to eat and, you know, $10 will be nice because he'll eat for two days but it doesn't really actually <laughs> solve the problem, right? So sort of, uh, so yeah, it is more complex to talk, to think about these real things. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, people might behave completely differently depending on how you frame the exact same thing. Yeah. So we, we therefore just had in mind to keep it comparable and just say $2 yeah. to trees or two dollars to poor people uh, yeah that's probably the right choice for your because you're not really interested in the scaling that's just what yeah. came to my mind now yeah that would be interesting in itself so if people bargain over trees <laughs> that's, that's, yes. a different, that's a different that's a different paper yeah it's a different paper yeah Okay, maybe I, you know, other people might have questions. Please, please go ahead. This is your chance. Maybe Paul, just one more thought. When, when I'm looking at the current uh, regulatory development with the SFDR uh, and, and also in the US, you know, with these law cases, I see more and more, I think many asset managers and probably also advisors see sustainability as a compliance risk. You know, mm -hmm. kind of in the, so far it has been, you can recommend anything on sustainability. As long as your client, you know, accepts it, that's fine. You, you cannot be, you know, sued because it was not sustainable enough. But yeah. when I look at the industry, I feel that this is changing, that many people are afraid of getting sued because they sold something as green that's maybe not as green as it is. So I don't know, but I think this could also be an interesting angle to, to look at kind of fear of, I mean, financial advisors, I guess they're really sensitive to not you know sell anything that's in the wrong risk profile for example because yeah. that will have drastic consequences for them there's so much yes. you know compliance on this but 
so far there has been almost nothing on, on the green aspects, but this is changing. So I wonder whether that could also influence your results or it could be looked at. Yeah. Yeah, I have to think how to incorporate that in, uh, in, in, in the experiment when you would have to sort of do an audit or something where, you, uh, where there's a chance that they get that they get audited, whether the portfolio is responsible enough. Uh, that, that would be one thing that comes to my mind. I, I don't yet know how to then, <laughs> uh, what that would do. Um, in talking about this more broadly, I, I don't think that, that ever more lawsuits uh, are, are helping here, right? So I think it's much better to, to come up with some smart design choices like the dollar signs to show the fees. Mm. Than, than it is to to have constant lawsuits because also how do you how do you say what is a sustainable and not sustainable portfolio when it it, it, it becomes very difficult I I think yeah. I, I agree but I think just you know the the fact that you know sustainability sustainability is suable you know yeah like that changes the game a bit. So it's that no definitely longer... changes the game. Yeah. Yeah. No, that really does. Uh, and it, it, that's an interesting thing by itself. Mm -hmm. Because of the risk, you see that that is indeed the case. And that's, uh, yeah, banks just like, like the interesting thing, I was talking to some banks about the sustainability information that they have to provide. So, so sometimes they have to provide these big documents and they, they are available on the site. And over a whole year, there are eight people that clicked on that. So what, mm -hmm. what, what's the point? So I think <laughs> the regulation particularly needs to be smarter and not, and not necessarily more. Okay, well, um, we're nearing the end of the hour. So I don't know if anybody has other pressing questions for Paul. Otherwise, uh, Paul, I, you know, I'd like to thank you. And maybe you have a few closing words for us before I stop the recording. Something, uh, something of importance, perhaps, or a final joke. <laughs> a final um, joke, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't have one... Uh prepared right now uh, so uh, I, I would just like to thank everybody uh, for for the comments and uh, if you have any more questions uh, later on you can always just send me an email and I'm always happy to chat super thank you so much <laughs>